The Pixel 7 series phones are leading from the front. They are the very first series phone, period, that is only running on 64-bit apps. And if you're not a phone nerd, you're not a tech nerd, then this might not mean a whole lot to you, but it's a good thing. This is something that started a long time ago in the PC world to when we finally opened it up. We got dual core processors, all that good stuff. There was a migration back with, I think Windows 7 was the first one that was might have been all 64-bit. I know Windows 10 was. I think it started with Windows Vista where they had the opportunity you could get 32-bit or 64-bit OS. And what that does, there are a couple different benefits here. And one, it's faster. The way that it opens up and it allows uh, support for different instruction sets and how it's processed with the processor, the 64-bit architecture versus the 32, it's about 25% faster and more efficient. So that's good. So anytime you run a 64-bit app versus a 32-bit app, it's faster, it works better. That's a good thing. It actually also uses up less RAM. Now, this is kind of funny. <laughs> Google says that it uses 150 megabytes less RAM in the OS or whatever it's running the apps or whatever. So uh, that's kind of interesting. It seems like not a big benefit, but hey, I mean, 150 megabytes is 150 megabytes. Just the fact that it saves a little bit, that's cool, right? It makes the phone more secure. It makes it where the process is on the back end and how it uses security software. I can't remember the particular process that they use, but it said that it's more, it's more secure. So that's a good thing. Less opportunity for people to be hacking into and taking over your phone. And it's something they led the way on from a long time. They introduced 64-bit apps. They were the first one back in 2014. Then they started requiring support in 2019. And now with the Pixel 7, 7 Pro, full-on 100% 64-bit apps. So that's really cool. That's something that only the Pixel 7 does. And I'm sure this is something that's going to trickle down to other phones. And it also allows for faster updates for software for people who are updating their apps and stuff like that. It's something that makes things more streamlined, especially moving forward. So ideally, one day when everybody gets on 64-bit app support only, like no more 32-bit, probably this will take several years. Once we get to that point, that's gonna be a native plus across the board. All the phones will be running the native support for 64-bit apps, and that's what they're gonna be running. I mean, they support them now, but running only on 64-bit is a big shift. So that's something cool. It's a bragging point for those of us who are using the Pixel 7 and the 7 Pro. It's a nice thing that we can kind of put our hat and hang our hat on when it comes to Google because there's a lot of things they do behind the scenes when it comes to software, when it comes to hardware, all sorts of different things, but it helps when you're the one that makes Android. <laughs> you don't have to rely on somebody else. So this will allow them to get updates, push them out faster, and it'll allow for more efficiency. We want more efficiency. We want things to run faster, and it's, it's a net win. This isn't like, okay, they need to go back to the drawing board and make the processor more powerful. No, they're just gonna get on board using the right architecture and using the right programming and the right words, talking to the phone and how it processes stuff. And just by virtue of getting everything on the same page and efficiency, optimizing it, you get more power. And that's a great thing. Think of it, a 25% boost. You're not gonna get that really anywhere else outside of changing the hardware. Usually year over year, we look at the Snapdragon processors Typically, that's kind of the benchmark. If you look at going from one major chip to the next, so like let's say we go from the Snapdragon 888 to like the 8 Generation 1, typically you get about 20% power and you get about 20-30% ba battery efficiency supposedly. That's kind of a year-over-year -year thing. Every time they make another step, usually when you go from one nanometer step down to the next, that's about what you get. You get about a 20-30% power increase, about a 20% 20, 30% battery increase, and, and that's give or take some. Sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less. It really depends on what the manufacturer is prioritizing, and also heat is a big thing. You have to worry about heat, and that's the latest thing this last year. Moving into next year, you'll probably see it a lot. More heat piping, more heat sinks, more dissipation, more all that stuff. <laughs> all those things they put inside the phone to help keep it from overheating, because unfortunately, when you have phones, they're really, really thin. Like, like they said in Talladega Nights, really, really thin pancakes. You know, crepes, Ricky Bobby refused to say that, he, that he liked really, really thin pancakes and got his arm broke. So when you take a look at this, there's not a whole lot of room. If you look at my computer tower down here, I've got a dual radiator fan system. I've got an, it's an all-in-one liquid cooler for my processor. It helps keep my, my computer cool. So whenever I play games and all those great things, it doesn't overheat. There's a lot of space to move air in there to keep it cool. You don't have that in here. It's all passive radiation. 
passive radiation for heat means that it just happened like you just have to find a way to, to dissipate it without using a fan. It's not an active way of cooling. And I've actually got a phone that has an active cooling system. The Redmi Magic, it's like the 6S Pro, whichever one I have now, <laughs> that's really, I'm sure that inspires a lot of confidence. I, I'm working on my video. By the time I get to the video, I will remember the name because I don't have the box in front of me. But yeah, it has an actual cooling fan in it that runs at like 10,000 RPM, rotations per minute. It's pretty cool. It has LED lights, sucks the hot air out. Makes it cooler for the phone. That's great because you get more better performance when it comes to gameplay. The Google Pixel phones don't have anything like that. So when you take a look at the Google phone and you can get a 25% performance and efficiency increase just out of making it 64-bit only and not using the 32-bit apps, and that's pretty cool. Now, this might not be on an app-by-app -app basis. I'm sure a lot of the apps that these phones that Google's been using for a while are kind of using the 64-bit apps already, but now it's saying, okay, we're only supporting 64-bit, so that just means it's going to get better across the board. The baseline will now be better and more efficient. It'll be safer, more secure, faster, and it'll take up less RAM. So that's a lot of cool things, and I wanted to share this video because I was reading about it. I'm like, man, this is really cool. Like this is something that you don't really hear about because one, it's kind of a nerd topic. This is not really a topic. A lot of folks go sit down and, hey guys, check out the new Pixel 7. Oh my gosh, it's only running 64-bit apps. You don't see that. I'm being a little being a little extra right now because that's where you get a lot of videos. A lot of people like to be so dynamic and extra. And I know I don't really bring a lot of excitement to the, to the table whenever I talk, but yeah, it's a cool thing. I, I've been... The reason I got into electronics and phones and stuff in the first place is I actually started building computers when I was very young. I was about 11 years old. I built my first computer. I used to mow yards. There was a guy that went to my church down the street and he would pay me in computer parts. He had a, like a side computer business. My very first computer I ever built was a 386. So this is way back a long time ago before the Pentium days, before all the Intel stuff, Intel inside all the great stuff. We're talking about a long time ago. I had four megabytes of RAM in that computer, 190 megabyte hard drive, and I had a Cyrix DX2 386 processor clocked at 33 megahertz. 33 megahertz. The chip in this phone is almost three gigahertz. That's how far we've come in like the last 36 years. It's just insane. Not 36 years, 26 years. I don't do math well in public. So I built computers for the longest time. I built that, uh, built several 486 computers, 586, 686, post gigahertz world. I still build all of my computers. So I'm a big computer nerd. And I think maybe that helps out a little bit when I talk about the phone stuff, because when you think about what's inside the phone, it's all just really small computer parts. So it's always something that's been easier for me to understand and explain, I think. But I think that it's cool. It's nice to see Google leading from the front. It's nice seeing, okay, we've got something cool to brag about here. We're the only 64-bit only club when it comes to smartphones. And that's going to be great as we move forward into basically the future. So I wanted to share this with you guys. Uh, I thought it was neat. And now you know. And knowing is half the battle, right? So G.I. Joe. So that's all I've got here today. If you have any questions or comments, then please go down in the comment section. I'll get back with you. If you enjoyed the video, if you like this stuff, if you like these kind of dynamic, nerdy topics where I talk a little bit more about maybe some of the underlying stuff in the phone as not so much, ooh, it's shiny and glossy and has a great camera and all that stuff. Let me know. Let me know if you like these kind of videos. So yeah, that's it. Going to sign off. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like and the subscribe button and the little notification bell if you want updates when new videos come out. And as always, thanks for being here. I appreciate you watching and I'll see you guys next time.